Hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and our series on class role-playing continue... <clears throat> I'm just gonna do the turn. We good. There we go. <clears throat> hey there YouTube, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and our class role-playing series continues because you signed a contract and now you gotta go to Georgia. So let's fiddle around with warlocks today on WebDM. Let's get to our next uh, thing here, which is the Warlock. Ooh. Beseeching those in power for that power. Yes. For, uh, you know, purposes, purposes. Nefarious and virtuous. The Warlock is is one of those classes that to me stands out in, in 5th edition. Not only because it's got like an extra thing. Your patron is kind of like your subclass, right? But then it's got that pact boon. Thinking about it in terms of how that manifests in your, your choices for role-playing a uh, warlock, you have a lot to juggle and consider, and yeah. particularly because your character comes with an NPC that, that deserves some attention. Unlike others, I mean, yeah, you could have, yeah, you could have contacts and stuff like that, but like your power directly comes from an NPC. Right. That you have to keep in mind to a degree. Yeah, yeah. Of keeping them happy. I didn't quite pick up on the really the first few times that I that someone in the party um, that we were playing in had made a warlock. Emma kind of pointed out she'd made a warlock. Yeah, you know, she was like, yeah, that really. I feel like the warlock needs to. There needs to be more demands placed upon the warlock. It did get me sort of thinking that it really does. Uh, behoove dungeon masters and, and players of warlocks to spend a lot of time thinking about who their patron is, what they get up to, what the relationship between the patron and warlock is. Because without it, the warlock is just sort of like a low rent arcanist that, depending on what sort of style of game you run, might never have enough spells and, mm -hmm. and might always kind of be behind the curve. But it's where the patron relationship comes in and the role-playing possibilities that that brings as well as being a receiver of patronage um, that that really lets you kind of expand out and create these sort of interesting um, interesting characters that maybe that's sort of what that's part of the appeal of the warlock is this the role-playing possibilities of the patron and that relationship so it's kind of like worth thinking what what sort of patron do you have what's the nature of of the of the relationship um, you know, between patron and, and uh, warlock. That starts with uh, the demeanor of the patron, right? Like, their, what's their attitude? Sort of one of the things that the Xanathar's Guide gives us is um, is these sort of tables for creating uh, different characters, and the patron's attitude is, you could have everything running the gamut from the patron is almost antagonistic a little with, bit. With, with their warlock, and the relationship there is the patron's constantly managing the warlock, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do all these things, I'm not gonna give you the power if you don't, and the warlock resents that. Particularly if the warlock needs the patron, but yeah. resents that that that, ne that necessity. Right, right. Um, that you can have sort of a, a, a weird dynamic as the patron tries to figure out what their warlock's doing. Why is this, why is it over here and not doing what I want it to do? And the warlock is just like, yeah, I got, really got to lay low. My patron's breathing down my back. I'm mm -hmm. working overtime this week. Yeah. And I just can't uh, can't handle it. <laughs> you made the mistake of signing on the dotted line with a hag, and she's like, hey, there, there was a newborn. Yeah, uh -huh. got to bring that newborn. Mm -hmm. and, and so, like, maybe your patron does require you to do despicable things because your patron is sort of despicable. Was the relationship always that way or has it turned sour at some point this is something that can easily change over the course of a campaign as your warlock takes different actions and depending on what sort of patron that you've set up for them the patron might not like that the patron might be angry the patron might be like yeah i really wanted that magic item that you guys got like mm -hmm. you should have gotten that for me that's kind of my thing and it creates a sense of conflict potential conflict at least between the warlock and the party because the party might always be thinking like what what's this person going to do if their war if their patron comes calling and requires us to make a sacrifice and so depending on what kind of group that the players are playing in that kind of antagonism between party members and and conflict between party members whether it comes to PVP or not can be potentially rewarding and potentially lead to um, conflict that gets resolved, growth that comes after, and a character that changes and develops and has a sense of, of dynamism to themselves. You can go the opposite direction. 
and your patron's a staunch ally yeah. and constantly in your corner and they're basically just a, a more involved, less powerful deity. Doesn't make a lot of demands on the warlock and there could be any number of reasons for it. It could be that, the, let's say you're an Archfey uh, warlock and your patron is the queen of the summer court something like that and mm -hmm. she just likes your warlock you can't really do anything about it maybe you don't necessarily return the affection but she has invested yeah. a portion of her power in you maybe willingly maybe unwillingly uh, maybe regret the decision now you yeah know. yeah you got drunk at a, at a at a fey party and you wake up in the bed oh, with her and then now, now she's of, your patron now she's your patron and that's why still don't you eat never, the food you never eat the food uh, you never drink the wine don't accept favors don't accept gifts uh, you really just shouldn't cross that hedgerow into fairy to begin with. You should probably just should have stayed outside. In terms of uh, a patron as an ally, they could they could provide vital information for the warlock uh, and the party. But at the same time, there should always be an element of risk. The warlock should never feel safe around their patron. The warlock should never feel like that everything's copacetic and that they can just kind of relax. Yeah. But first off, there's a power dynamic. There's a power imbalance. The patron clearly outstrips the warlock in terms of power and influence and magical might and differs from a deity in that the deity and cleric relationship is one of devotion and faith and, and reverence. Yeah, yeah. Whereas that's not necessarily the case with the warlock. No. 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 <laughs> no. And it's usually because as the warlock, you probably didn't read the fine print, right? Uh, you probably didn't. You can think about like the terms of a contract and, and, and what's going on as a legalistic binding kind of thing. And maybe the dungeon master actually spells it out. Here's what your patron requires of you. Or maybe it is more informal, like say an archfey might uh, impart upon the party and it's just kind of like oh yeah now you're my you're my champion you're my you're my warlock i will occasionally from time to time ask you to do things never at a convenient time for you and will be very upset and cross if you don't do it and you don't make me a priority and so in that sense you can like draw a lot of inspiration <laughs> from and need to be careful when you do this uh, but you can draw a lot of inspiration from like codependent relationships and other sorts of uh, relationships that that have a, a, an imbalance of power and an element of to be frank sort of abuse in them mm -hmm. and you would want to get your you'd want to talk with your players about this but if you have say a, 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 a an archfey patron then this is a creature who is not mortal and is not uh, interested in mortal pursuits and whose passions and, and uh, wants and desires are not um, di or difficult to satisfy. Yeah. And you could run afoul of, of your, your patron very quickly, even if you start off as an ally and, and a favored one by not uh, jumping when the patron says jump. There's a uh, sort of a third axis of that, sort of an, an indifferent patron. Could, uh, could be as well. Maybe the terms of the pact are such that you've performed the ritual of patronage and the great old one that lives in the dark between stars will one day descend back into its, its, uh, its earthly throne and scour the world of these pesky little creatures that have infested it since then could care less yeah. what you do. But in order to continue to draw magical power from it, you have to assist it. You have to aid it in some way in its goals. But it's otherwise indifferent. It never contacts you. It never... Yeah. But in order to keep up your end of the bargain, you have to do things for it, regardless of whether or not it notices. You could be an unwitting warlock, perhaps, like you're saying, like a drunken... A night of drunken revelry, and you wake up uh, with your name signed to uh, a devil's pact and a copy of the contract in your pocket and a, uh, you know, a, a, a mark branded on your forehead where, mm -hmm. <laughs> where Levistus or, <laughs> or Mephistopheles yeah, yeah. or someone has decided that you are, uh, you know, that, you, that, that you're the new, uh, you're the new kid on the uh, warlock block. There's just a lot of ways, is, is, the, is the patron involved? That'll be under the terms of the, 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 the pact as well. How involved is the patron? Does it contact you regularly? Does it give you a magic item or something yeah, yeah. that you can use to contact it? Is it detached and aloof and yet wrathful 
and vindictive when it's not when when you treat it the same way. This is why I like the archfate, right? Because you could have one that's like, oh yeah, I'm totally not ever going to pay attention to you, and I'm your patron, and and you'd better, but you better always be paying attention to me. Why didn't you text me back? Why didn't you, <laughs> why didn't you give me that present that I wanted? Yeah. Why didn't you do that? But I'm never going to do anything for you. I saw that you saw my message. Like I saw that you saw it. I saw that you saw. You can't respond. I see how it is. Yeah, this is one of the ways in which a dungeon master and a player need to sit down and hash this out. Figure out how involved is your patron? How detached are they? What's their attitude towards you? That will change, and there should be dynamism in that relationship, and you should do things that piss off your patron. Sometimes you should do things that doesn't, and it's up to the DM and the player to determine why Number one, the magic isn't taken away from the warlock. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and number two, if it is, <laughs> what's the option there? Yeah. Um, I, it'd be interesting to role play through a scenario in which the warlock angers their patron to such a degree that they cancel the terms of the pact. And what does that mean for the warlock? It could be quite bad. Yeah, if you're uh, a fourth them. level warlock, now what are you? Is it one of those things where the, the patron is imparting knowledge and power into you that can't be taken back? Right, like, is it one of those things where the power that that's bestowed upon them a one-way street? Maybe the patron tries to keep that fact a secret from the warlock, and and discovering the fact that the power invested in a warlock is permanent, and cannot be revoked by the patron. They're not a god, right? right? They're not omnipotent. They just are really powerful, and um, and and maybe discovering that about the warlock evens things out a bit and the warlock can be like yeah i can walk away whenever i want and keep what you've given me Mm -hmm. um so you better play nice as well yeah Um, i mean they'll probably have to be dealing with the agents of that patron for the rest of their life but sure but that's just a small price to pay for free magic right (laughs) you didn't have to study Mm -hmm. you weren't born with it you stole it and and that's another thing about it. Did the warlock is the warlock stealing this power? And the patron would other uh, the patron is the one that's unwitting and unwilling. And it's the warlock going. I performed the ritual of patronage. You can't do anything about it. I mm-hmm. am taking your power. And perhaps as long as uh, certain tenets uh, of the ritual are met, the patron can't do anything about it. But if you mm-hmm. step outside those lines. It's going to come at you with all manner of, of minions and curses and, and the full wrath of a, a powerful being who's gotten who's been hoodwinked. What's some interesting angles to take with the boons, do you think? Like, as yeah, far as... Okay. I like the idea of, of a warlock, like a pact of the blade, where uh-huh. they want to be badass with a sword, and so they go through this ritual, and the patron literally plunges a sword into their chest mm-hmm. until it's gone. Yeah. And then now... You can manifest this energy or this this uh-huh. sword. I don't know. I just no. I, I, I like, like that, that though because that imagery. I don't know what it is. I for some reason I get the impression that there's not as much reskinning and and determining what the mechanical effects in a class what they what they manifest it as for that player. Maybe I'm just out of touch or, or, or something. But I, I I do think that it's worthwhile for players to think like, yeah, what does it mean when I chose uh, the, the Pact of the Blade? And, and my pact boon is to summon whatever weapon I want. Is it a torturous situation where your, your, your patron is shoving weapons into you and then magically fusing them with your body so that you have them mm-hmm. when you need them? What does it look like when you're invested with devil's sight? What does it look like when you wake up and you have uh, any number of the pact uh, boons and eldritch invocations um, that are available to warlocks Those are moments where the patron is reaching out and investing part of their power in the warlock, and they could, they should be role played through. Even if it's just a quick cut scene that the DM like Mm -hmm. describes and the player sort of participates in when they level up, it's 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 worth it. It's it's those moments where you never know what's going to come out of them. You never know when something interesting is going to develop, uh, or, or some moment of role-playing goodness yeah. <laughs> uh, can happen. Particularly if you have a player who's willing to take the time to to equally participate in this moment in the campaign with you, and doesn't just be like, "Yeah, DM, you do all the work, and I'll just sit here and play my character." Because you should be striving to do to be more involved in the games that you, you know that you're in. Because dealing with patrons, uh, it's going to leave a mark, right? It's absolutely going to leave a mark. Some of the Eldritch invocations will leave a mark, right? Like, what if Devil's Sight t- 
turns your eyes pitch black. It's where the iris gets rid of the retina, and it's just like this black orb of, of inky darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, eyes of the they room turn keeper. turn to black. Right. <laughs> yeah, like they're just, uh, it, they look like they're holes in your head. Yeah, negative space. Right. And, yeah, it'd be kind of creepy, right? Yeah, what if eyes of the room keeper made your eyes like bleed and drip and weep magic? so that there's a, a, you know, a manifestation of it. When you're using your magical sight, it's like, like in uh, Ghostbusters 2, where the guy's like walking down the hall and his eyes are like flashlights, mm -hmm. sort of like scanning things. What if that's what your detect magic looks like? And it's sort of a physical manifestation of it. There's others, it could be tattoos, brands, change of hair color, eye color, skin color, any number of cosmetic differences that the player may or may not be able to hide and keep secret. Um, any of those are, are, are great ways to sort of like, they're springboards, right? They're, mm. they're great ways to, to have a springboard for uh, role-playing moments where your character has to explain themselves to someone or has to, to cover this thing up because they know like, yeah, warlocks around here are not trusted. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, that's the other thing, right? Like, how does your war warlock fit into the world? And if your warlock is, is one where um, you know, people frown on that, then a, a brand or a mark uh, from a patron, you're going to want to keep hidden. But that mm -hmm. patron might be like, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, not, if you want the, not if you want the good stuff, you're not. Maybe your binding mark has to be on display for you to gain those powers. And if you cover it up, then you just don't get them right now. Yeah, now I'm thinking of uh, with the mark, Catterley, the cleric quintet. Uh -huh. The one cleric who is his rival who goes off and, I mean, he becomes a vampire, but he has the mark, because uh -huh. he, he starts with a D, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> but it's kind of the same thing, he goes off and gets some power, and he comes back, and I know he's kind of a vampire, but, yeah. you know. It's, but still, it's sort of the same, kind of in the same vein. Um, I, I, I do kind of like that idea that the player can switch on and off their magical power through covering up or attempting to conceal a, a, a binding mark. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, it, 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 it it makes the dungeon master answer some questions, and they should be. They should be asking these questions about how classes fit into their world, what it means, how the common people of their world perceive them. Are uh, are warlocks really seen as sort of reckless and mad, and and always pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable? And are they the ones that are discovering new spells and magic, and then that slowly trickles down through through wizards, and and, and they pick up uh, and study it? Are they venturing into new areas of magical research, aided and assisted by their patrons? That the wizards are going to take it's going to take them longer to get there, even if they even if they you know, are willing to do it in the first place. Because it's sort of the one thing that uh, that I think warlocks and wizards share with each other that maybe sorcerers don't, because sorcerer's magic is innate. Both uh, for wizards and warlocks, the magic is external, that they have to then take into themselves. And you can have this sort of relationship between wizards and warlocks where maybe wizards sort of look, look, look askance at the warlock. I'm like, hmm, I don't like what's going on over here, Mr. Mm -hmm. Warlock. Uh, your power didn't come through hard work and study and relying upon the, the traditions of time-honored spell casting. Mm -hmm. uh, you cheated, you cut in line, you contacted something you shouldn't have and now you've got power. What if, you, what if the warlock just found the right book? That's the and other that, thing, right? That is your patron. It's also your tome. It's also your tome that you have, that eventually but starts your, transmitting your, new spells to you. Yeah. Yeah. Your patron talk like is the book and talks to you. And in that regard, uh, I'm thinking of Neil Stevenson's no, uh, Diamond Age. Diamond Age. Yes. Where the little girl Nell Nell <laughs> is a warlock who learns everything she learns from her from magic her, fairy book. Uh, what is it? Her primer. Her the, the a young lady's primer. A young lady's like illustrated primer. A young lady's illustrated primer. Uh, that's not a bad idea for a warlock, particularly for a warlock who got to, or, or particularly for a patron who got to their warlock early, mm -hmm. right? Like, what if it is a case, particularly thinking something like fiendish, yeah. right? Like, most most adults in a D&D world might know to avoid magical contracts from beings that appear out of nowhere promising the world, mm -hmm. but children might not. No. And a, children, a child might accept a gift given to them by a friendly stranger mm -hmm. um, and not realize the implications that they that uh, of what happened and as they age and this object sticks with them and the power is there and starts growing and growing and growing then as an adolescent or a young adult they realize the mistake they made or the burden that's placed on them or just the potential that they have 
Um, and now the, the 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 patron sort of comes out of hiding and reveals themselves at this at long last. Um, but this object that they had, this gift that they accepted, is sort of the physical token of a pact mm -hmm. informally signed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so Jim, what are what are some what are some off brand? What are some brand X <laughs> warlocks, so to speak? I, it's a tough one because I think that warlocks cover so many different mm -hmm. concepts and archetypes. And mechanically speaking, for, for just for just for a second, there's so many decision points in the warlock, and it's possible to create so many different types. The pact boon and the patron and the, and the invocations and the spells, you're getting, you're having to make so many different decisions, you can end up with this myriad of different concepts, kind of hard to figure out which mm -hmm. ones are, are off, uh, off brand. I would say that the one I'm most interested in exploring is that idea of a reluctant or an unwilling warlock. Mm -hmm. One who was tricked or deceived or, 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 or at the very least was ignorant yeah. of, of the, uh, the pact that they were making and now seeks to get out. They, they, they kind of want to get out. Um, yeah, I love the idea of you have an adventurer who pissed off a succubus, so she takes the form of a human woman, mm -hmm. makes the adventurer fall in love with her, mm -hmm. and then sets up a scenario in which his now wife looks like she's in peril and might die, and yes. he beseeches anyone who will mm -hmm. to and contract that, forms. And that succubus is Archduke. <laughs> and then a contract forms, and he's like, I'll do whatever, uh -huh. and then his wife opens her eyes and looks at him and goes, well, let's begin then. And yeah. So his own wife in love is the succubus in which is his patron. Right. And thus you have love and hate. Love and, and hate. All of that wrapped and, up. And all of it, yeah. And particularly if the deceit is kind of, if she continues to sort of like pretend that maybe she's possessed and in peril constantly mm -hmm. and that therefore the contract constantly needs to be renewed or referenced and then... Um, yeah, I, I, I can see something like that. Someone who is tricked into mm -hmm. being a warlock, particularly if the terms of the pact yeah. are onerous or difficult yeah. or, or something where they have to perform these tasks or rituals or whatever that they, they might not want to. Maybe they're unpleasant. Maybe they're downright despicable, depending yeah. on what kind of patron they are. Or at least bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. You know, uh, we talked a bit in, the, in the, the last time we talked about warlocks of just like weird things that a great old one might ask you to do in order to make the warlock world right for its arrival. But it's the same thing with a, with an archfey or, or, or even a, a fiend. They might just ask you to do weird things. Yeah. Um, uh, another one I was thinking of, and I don't know if this is more appropriate for sorcerers or warlocks. I like warlock just because it is a thing that changes you. Mm -hmm. But like, think of the movie, uh, it's a little bit cheesy, John Travolta's Phenomenon. <laughs> He all of a sudden gets a tumor that <laughs> okay. causes him to ha start okay, spontaneously sure. like having this power. So you think the the third edition cancer mage would work better as uh, a warlock? I'm just I saying, if it's just like that. a like a piece, like if it's a fragment of a god's a dead god's personality, right, 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 that falls to the prime material plane and inhabits this person. It inhabits this person, so it has its own sentience, uh -huh. and eventually it will. Be like, all of a sudden, one day you don't feel so well, and you hear a voice. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, well, we can work that, through this that together. That's not a bad idea for like a celestial pact or a celestial patron, right? Yeah. Like, it's something different than like, oh yeah, my 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 player or my character ran across a planetar or a solar or mm -hmm. a particularly powerful unicorn or something. Um, I, I like that where it's like this is a cast off piece. Mm -hmm. This this god is or, dead, or the last essence, the last of essence this, of it, of right? This. Bef as its corpse floats through the astral sea, the last essence of it descends into the prime material and plants itself in the brain of the warlock and that's how this god is going to keep itself alive mm -hmm. until it can rebuild. And maybe the terms of the pact are, this guy's like, I, I don't know what god we're talking about here, but we yeah. should totally worship it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But yeah, in that movie, he cast Comprehend Languages uh -huh, uh -huh. as a 10-minute ritual. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's on the way to the thing. It's been forever since you know, Yeah, forever. you know, and it's, uh, you know, invention and, and telekinesis. Uh -huh. and it, maybe not an unwilling warlock, but one that was just like not aware they'd signed a pact. And now they're like, why can I 
manifest a sword whenever I'm angry. <laughs> Why does a sword appear in my hand when my adrenaline's up? I right. don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe they only talk to their 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 patron in, in dreams. In dreams, and So yeah. that's why they have to slowly start to realize, like, oh, wait, I can talk to this thing. Yeah. And uh, has to learn how to dream properly. It's uh -huh. a lucid dream. Uh-huh. They think that the, the imp that's coming, that suddenly appeared around them is terrorizing them. And this creature is just, you know, its help is a burden. <laughs> more of a hindrance, really. It's really more. You don't it's really like, want this thing helping like, you. <laughs> thanks for helping me. Did you have to burn my house down to do it? to do it? Yeah. It's those kinds of things that, that I think really open up possibilities for, for messing with the player. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a patron that's a little tricksy, a little we don't know where we stand just yet, you can have those kind of... Um, moments where the player maybe regrets <laughs> briefly you don't want to make it too burdensome because at the end of the day they, they chose warlock because they like uh, some combination of the the class's theme and the mechanics you don't mm -hmm. want to make they don't make them regret that decision no but <laughs> it, at least at least make them think about their decisions and what they're willing to do yeah. to retain that power absolutely because yeah. that's you know i don't know it's a, it's it's a little self-reflection the warlock is to me I keep coming back to it as a class that I really want to try out and, and play more of. I made a ton of like second and third level warlocks that never really get that far off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of, it carries with it, I think maybe, maybe more than any other class, this embedded um, potential for, for engaging and dynamic role playing. An arc or a development or something that yeah. it's baked in. Yeah. It says like, no, you've got this, this thing in your life that you're going to have to deal with. You, you don't know if that's going to end up being an anchor that weighs you down or your path to glory. A pacifist that a, that a, a sentient blade decides, I want him to wield I me. I want him to wield me because he's the only one who understands what I'm going to ask of it. You know, and I'm going Going to ask of it to lead a path of bloody conquest uh, mm -hmm. or something like that and I need someone who doesn't revel in it but who understands that this is a necessity and a burden that must be borne and yes and so the guy constantly dreams of this weapon and constantly seeks it out and something similar with a hex blade that I was playing the playtest version of it where it was just a carpenter uh, a Viking carpenter is like a shipbuilder mm -hmm. is what I wanted and um, he's just looking for this certain hammer and he's just well, he's looking for an axe he dreams oh, axe. of a frozen axe ah. and all he knows is that it's somewhere in the mountains to the north doesn't know why he has to seek it out but that since he's had these dreams, he's become a killing machine. Yeah. Like that he got in a fight or a brawl and, and it was not, it did not end well for the others. He was a, you know, he already was, uh, always had a bit of a, a fight in him, but now it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, some power has invested itself in me. Yeah, it's yeah. tied up in this ax. Yeah. So you're, you're basically also, uh, I like using that, that kind of inspiration uh richard dreyfus in uh, close encounters of the third kind right he yes. starts dreaming of a mountain and making it and he has to go to it he has and to what go happens to it. in the what end happens what happens yeah his patron the aliens come and take him away to, right to who knows what the fuck you know who knows what's going to happen or what happens when he comes back mm -hmm. um and so i think that that's really one of those where uh, where as a player and the DM sit down uh, with their character and they sort of hash out, okay, what's the place of warlocks in the world? What's the place of your patron in the wider world? What's the nature of your the relationship with the patron? This is one of those where I would say, like, let's keep some things fuzzy. Let's not nail everything down at character creation. Yeah. And ask the player, is it okay if I keep some secrets from you that your character has to discover? Is it okay that some of this isn't 100% obvious to your character from the get-go? And that discovering what exactly is going on with your patron and, and the exact nature of your relationship can come out through play. And, and it, it allows for the dungeon master to both mess with the player, to, to tempt them, to, to, to try to trick them, to trip them up, to try to make them do things they might not otherwise have wanted to do. Um, and doing that could, um, could lead to a lot of really engaging role playing. Uh, as opposed to just like, yeah, we know everything about this relationship from the get-go. There's not going to be any surprises. Mm -hmm. um, leave yourself open for some surprises and secrets. Spawn. 
Spawn. Spawn is, is a, a perfect sure. ex. Yes, Spawn sure. is a fucking warlock. So what happens? Spawn. Spawn's like a cop who dies and then Spawn, goes to hell. Spawn's great because Spawn was a mercenary who dies. Oh yeah, he's a mercenary. The devil only brings him back to lead the armies of hell. He yeah, because he's killed more. He's he's yeah. he's killed more people and whatever. Sure. In recent history, than anyone else or some shit. Or, I or, just all I remember about Spawn is where he goes to fight. Um, What's the guy, what's the name? Malbolge? Malbolge. And he's like on his nipple. And then it's, re- it's revealed that they've just been fighting on his nipple the entire time. And he's really just this gigantic sort of, yeah, I think it was like issue 100 or something like that. That's not a bad one. Oh, no, yeah, he's totally that. And he's packed for the, he's packed for the chain, but it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different kind of chain. <laughs> I, I, I uh, yeah, Ra- uh, packed for the Raven Queen, which I really liked. I, I was sort of disappointed to see that it didn't make it into Xanathar's. Yeah, it's Could bullshit. be good for that. Like, uh, you came back. And there's a, in Xanathar's Lost Notes to everything else, the DM's Guild product, there's actually a dead background. Like, you used to be dead. You're not anymore. But you, <laughs> you were. <laughs> um, that could uh, that could fit really well. 